welcome everybody to Straight Science. Um, this is an evening science presentation put on by UAF Northwest Campus and UAF Alaska Sea Grant, and you're here tonight in the home office. And we acknowledge the indigenous peoples upon whose customary lands our UAF Alaska Sea Grant offices reside. And in the Bering Strait region, the UAF Northwest Campus is located on the customary lands of the Inupiaq, Siberian Yupik, and Yupik people. And tonight, there's great interest in tonight, and we're just so thrilled to be able to introduce Rick Toman coming back to the, the fold of Nome in the Bering Strait region where he does so much for everyone here. And um, Rick really needs no introduction here, but he is the Alaska Climate Specialist for the UAF Alaska Center for Climate Assessment and Policy. And we nowadays we all turn to Rick for just the magnificent amount of um, connectivity he provides to us and information he provides to us, especially during this time of such great change. So with that, Rick, I won't hold the audience back and I need to email OPIC, so get her your presentation. So with that, please take it away. Okay, thanks very much, Gay. And uh, thanks to all of you who have taken time out of your evening to uh, join in. And let's see if we can make the technology work here. So the theory is you should be able to see my title slide there. Is that true? Looks perfect. All right, great. All right, well, um, let's get started here. Um, I, I am coming to you from uh, Fairbanks, where I work at the University of Alaska Fairbanks for the Alaska Center for Climate Assessment and Policy. And uh, we are on the traditional and never ceded lands of the lower Tanana Dene people. And um, uh, happy to be here with you tonight. All right, here's what we're gonna talk about this evening. Gonna take a review of Western Alaska summer 2021 climate. I wanna start out with the Pan-Arctic view as um, most of you on the call know it was a pretty crappy summer in Western Alaska. That's a jargon term, so uh, I'll explain what I mean by that. But um, I, wanna, I wanna start out with the big view uh, and look at uh, how the summer played out at the large scale uh, around the Arctic. And um, you'll see that um, we had our own little, uh, our own little uh, market here on um, um, inclement weather. Then we'll drill down into what happened um, across Western Alaska. And, um, and then second part of the presentation, as we always do in the October straight science for the last, what's this year, game, year number four or five now, take a look at the winter ahead, what we have um, for uh, climate scale guidance and how things might work out uh, for us in the region. All right, so summer 21, 2021, the Arctic wide view. Uh, average temperatures for June, July, August are on the left hand side, and the precipitation uh, percentage of normal is on the right. You're looking straight down here on the North Pole, and I've labeled uh, Nome there for you. So you got Nome in the, in the lower center. So uh, uh, kind of uh, Arctic Canada is on the right-hand side of the graphics. Um, uh, Russia is on the left-hand side. Now, starting with temperatures on the left-hand side, okay, so you'll notice that Western Alaska has got that lighter blue color. It was a little bit below the 30-year uh, normal. These are all referenced to 1991 to 2020, our standard baseline period right now. But as you cast your eye around the Arctic, First of all, over the ocean, as is normal in the summer, temperatures are not very far from, from normal. Why is that? Because excess heat is going into melting sea ice and not raising air temperatures. So that's typically the way that works. You'll notice that portions of Arctic Canada were also in that shaded blue color, so uh, cooler than normal. But otherwise, there's a whole lot of uh, warm colors on there around the Arctic in Greenland, in uh, the Arctic portion of Europe, and especially to, uh, to the west of the Bering Strait there, that big red area there in Siberia that is centered there. 
in the uh, Sahara Republic, where they had tied for the warmest summer of record um, for, for, for June, July, August. And even, uh, even in Alaska, while it was cool across Western Alaska, Central and Eastern Alaska on into the Yukon were warmer than normal. So yeah, it was cool here, but that was not indicative of what was going on around the Arctic. Precipitation on the right-hand side, um, it didn't rain every day in Western Alaska. It only seemed that way, uh, but very wet portions of the region, as we'll see, had the wettest uh, summer on record. It was wet in other parts of of the Arctic, again, especially in portions of Canada, where it was also cool, cool and wet in the summer often go together, but not everywhere. You'll see there in Greenland, uh, areas that were warmer than normal also had above normal precipitation. Across Eurasia, as well as portions of Eastern Alaska and Northwest Canada were drier than normal. In, in uh, again, in the Sakha Republic there in Central Siberia, um, hot, tied for record warmest summer and uh, near to below normal precipitation. And they burned more than 20 million acres of land. Um, that's the largest amount of land burned in any one season that, that they have documented. And they have had big fire years, three years in a row now. So, so from the Pan-Arctic view, we were kind of special in that we we drew you know we drew the the uh, the ace there. If you wanted cool and rainy, you were in the right place. But uh, most places did not uh, did not draw that card for summer 2021. Now, sea ice minimum uh, here uh, you probably have heard on the news. Uh, we wound up with um, 12th lowest minimum since um, uh, 1979 when the satellite uh, record starts. And uh, the graphic here on the right-hand side shows you what the uh, ice was analyzed at uh, on that date. Of course, um, uh, not, none in the Bering Sea, as you would uh, expect always. But even though there was significantly more ice this year than last year at the minimum, last year, you may recall, was the second lowest uh, minimum for Arctic-wide ice extent this year, the 12th. It's still at the minimum in mid-September was nowhere near Alaska. Um, we had several weeks when there was no ice within a uh, hundred miles of any point in Alaska. And that is, and that is not like a return to the old days. On the um, left-hand side here, I've popped up a graphic. This is what the typical minimum sea ice looked like in the first 11 years of the satellite record, 1979 to 89. And you can see not only typically was there ice to the Alaska coast, notice that large portion of uh, Chukotka and, uh, and the uh, Siberian coast had ice typically even at the minimum and nothing like that um, this year. So yes, more ice this year than in some recent years, but in no sense a return to the old days. Now, speaking of that Siberian coast, and this, of course, is critically important uh, in the ongoing changes we're seeing in uh, through the Bering Strait region, that northern sea route. So that's that route that connects uh, the European and, uh, and north, um, we, we would call that the northwest portion of Siberia, uh, over the top of Siberia, Chukotka, and then down through the Bering Strait, that northern sea route. Sometimes um, in North America, we call that the Northeast uh, Passage. Um, and this is a graphic from our colleagues at the World Climate C uh, Service showing how many days there was an open path of, of uh, there's a path with open water um, all the way around the Siberian coast and down through the Bering Strait. Now, this only goes back to 2000. Um, this is using that satellite data. We could extend this back to 1979, but it'd be really boring because prior to 2000, there was only one year that would have any blue color here. The, the, the Northern Sea Route just was never ice-free or almost never ice-free in the past. And now you can see this very dramatic change with um, in last year, by far the latest with um, uh, 120 days 
of, of open water all the way around. Shorter this year uh, by quite a bit, um, and sh actually the shortest since 2010, but still, uh, again, not a return to the old days. Um, uh, yes, compared to the recent years, there was a lot of ice, um, but this, this is gonna be, in retrospect, this is gonna be a high ice year. 20 years, we'll be thinking back fondly of, um, oh, the, remember those ad ice conditions in 2021? Oh, amazing. All right, so big question, of course, is why did we have such crappy weather? Sorry, I keep using that technical term, but we'll explain it. Um, so a couple of things to help explain what, why we had the weather we had. This is, a, this is a graphic showing the middle of the atmosphere, pressure difference from normal. Any of the purple colors were lower pressure than normal in the mid levels of the atmosphere. And um, the, the orange uh, warm colors there, higher pressure than average. And you can see uh, the darkest colors there uh, over the, over the uh, kind of the northern Beaufort Sea, northern Chukchi Sea region, but with those purple colors extending down through the Bering Strait and were sandwiched in between that, that higher pressure than normal across Yakutia there, the Sakha Republic, and across the North Pacific. And that was a very stable pattern this summer, that low pressure across the, Ar the Arctic there, north of the Alaska coast. That's really why we kept so much more ice this year than, than previous years. This was a very persistent pattern. Over a three month period, this will often be an extremely boring map because over three months, this kind of averages out. Not so, not so much this year where, um, where we had this persistent pattern with this lower, uh, lower pressure aloft extending down through the Bering Strait. Now, the other feature that's important, there we go, um, were the wind directions. So again, so this is, a, this is at 10,000 feet. And what, this, what the arrows here are showing are not the, not the average wind direction for the summer, but rather the, the difference from normal winds. So across the Western Alaska, the Seward Peninsula into the Bering Strait, you can see those arrows are pointing from southwest to northeast. So we had more southwest wind than average across our region. Notice across uh, Chukotka there, south of Wrangell Island, the arrows are pointing kind of from, the, from northeast to southwest. So they had more onshore wind there uh, blowing from than is normal for, for that part of the world. So this explains a lot of, of the persistent clouds and rain that we had. It's very, very significant departures here from the normal winds is what this is showing. So uh, between the low pressure aloft and the southwest winds persistent through the season, uh, we wind up with the summer that we, that we uh, did. All right, so let's take a look at the sea ice here from the National Weather Service uh, sea ice program. The concentration analysis, June 1st on the left, July 1st in the middle, and August 1st in the, on the uh, right-hand side. So June 1st, still had some ice lingering across the northern Bering Sea. Not historically unusual, of course, but um, quite a change from recent years. The last ice in the Alaska waters cleared about June 27th. But you'll notice uh, by the time we got to July 1st, there is still some ice there in the far northwest uh, Bering Sea in the, in the Gulf of Anadir near the uh, Chukotka coast. Uh, and that did not melt out until, um, until about uh, July 18th. By August uh, 1st, of course, um, Bering Sea is free and we're seeing a nice ice retreat um, in the southern Chukchi Sea too. And of course it would continue to recede uh, beyond this. So. Um, uh, really, the, the take home here is, well, again, not a return to the old days, but much more ice in all of these in the appropriate regions than we've seen in the last uh, several years. 
Okay, one of the things that I keep track of is when, when the ice melts out in the Bering Sea. And so this is using the low resolution um, uh, satellite data. And uh, so what I define here is that the, the, we, I call the, the I, what I track here in the Bering Sea is when the sea ice extent gets to less than 50,000 square kilometers or about 19,000 square miles. Uh, that is about the area of the Seward Peninsula. So it's not when the last ice is gone. Um, that that uh, 19,000 square miles, that's near the limit of the accuracy of this low resolution data set. The main thing that we get uh, in the preliminary data, and, and this might wind up being a little earlier in the final data, but we definitely had as we saw in the, in the high resolution weather service analysis, ice considerably later than the last few years. And really it's gonna be pretty typical to when we saw ice melting pre 2000, certainly not late by, by historical standards, but um, much more like uh, what you would have expected if this was 1990 something. And of course, much later for this, uh, for the um, melt out than we had in 2000, uh, 17, 18, or 19, which of course are, are the very early years. All right, so zooming into Western Alaska here. So June through August, uh, 2021, so the summer. Uh, the warm colors here are areas where relative to our 30 year baseline, it was warmer than normal. The cool colors are where it was below that 30 year baseline average. For Nome, summer was an even one degree Fahrenheit cooler than normal. That made it the coolest summer since 2011. So yes, it's been a decade since it has been this cool, but one degree below normal even for the summer is not dramatic. Um, there's lots and lots of summers uh, pre-2000 that uh, were cooler than this. Now, notice there are a few areas that show up as warmer than normal in Western Alaska here. Those are over the, primarily over the water areas where the, our climatology, our 30 year baseline still has um, a decade or so of kind of the old ice conditions. So while most of the land was cooler than the normal, not dramatically by historical standards, but cooler. Um, the waters less so, um, uh, especially near the Alaska coast. Now, rainfall for the summer. This just shows you the percent of normal over the three month period. So the total rain over the three months. For Nome, 178% of normal, or if you prefer, 78% above normal. That's the most rain in the summer in Nome since 2012, it was the ninth wettest summer since um, in the last 114 years since Nome's uh, good climate record starts in 1907. Now, while Nome was wet, notice uh, in other portions of Western Alaska, it was even wetter. Uh, particularly St. Lawrence Island up through the Bering Strait and the Kotzebue area. Using the, the climate analysis model that, that I produced this graphic from, which goes back to 1950, for both St. Lawrence Island and the Bering Strait region, which, is which includes portions of the far eastern Chukotka Peninsula there, Diomede, Wales, and, and east to about Brevig. For both of those regions, this was the wettest summer uh, uh, in the last 72 years, just a little bit wetter than 2011. Kotzebue, uh, the station data, they had their wettest month ever in July. And north of Kotzebue, of course, uh, many of you know, it was exceptionally wet in both June and July and uh, persistent high water on the Noatak River um, it's produced a serious erosion problems at No Attack Village with the river threatening to eat into an old abandoned uh, landfill. And um, that, that would be bad news, but uh, they've had two years of high waters there. So really um, everywhere in Western Alaska, really uh, quite a soaker. 
No, I think maybe one of the, even more so maybe than the rain, and certainly more so than the temperatures, um, cloudy, cloudy, cloudy. And um, sure enough, our climate analysis model um, supports everybody's impression that there was, you just couldn't buy much sunshine this summer. So the, this graphic is from our colleagues at the World Climate Service. It's using that same, same climate analysis model that I've been showing, but this ranks the amount of sunshine uh, for the three months for the summer, uh, for this summer compared to all summers since 1960. And you can see here that darkest color, a huge area, there was less sun this summer than any year since, um, since 1960. So um, unless, you're, unless you're getting to retirement age, um, you have not experienced the summer as cloudy as this. And even that second shade of gray there, that, that's the second, um, that's, that was the second cloudiest of summer. I think that only Gamble was the only community that fell into that. And that was 1989, that was, uh, that was in second place. So your impression that this was a really gray summer is um, spot on. And of course that did cause um, some problems, at least in areas that had some fish runs uh, this summer with um, being able to, to dry uh, fish. Um, if you couldn't get any fish, that was less of a problem, but it was a really dismal summer. And to, uh, we can, I think we can tie this back to that low pressure aloft and those southwest winds, much more southwest winds than normal across the region. And uh, two ingredients to help really boost and maintain uh, the cloud cover across the region in summer 2021. All right, turning now to the oceans. So temperature departure again from our 30 year baseline, 1991 to 2020. So this is the, the latest 30 year period. And this is for the full warm season, May through September. Bullseye on Gnome there, just to locate it for you. Couple of really interesting things here. Uh, one, you'll notice much of Norton Sound, the Yukon Delta, near to a smidge above normal, but really not, not very dramatically different than normal. And other areas, large portions of the Northern Bering Sea in that first uh, blue shade. So that's just um, one, a half to one and a half degrees Fahrenheit cooler than normal. However, where that ice lingered longest in the Gulf of Anadir, significantly cooler than normal. Um, and similarly, um, near shore on, on the northern Chukotka coast, uh, where ice lingered long, uh, significantly cooler than normal, as well as in the northern Chukchi Sea there. The other thing that's going to strike your eye here is a draw a line uh, northwest to southeast that goes through St. Matthew Island there. And you see both south of there, uh, there's warm colors, warmer than normal. That's been the pattern we've seen in Bering Sea temperatures, really not just for the warm season. We had that, that same pattern most of last winter, and that's why the ice never got very far south of St. Matt last winter. The same pattern, cool in the north, warm in the south, has been, has been with us, really, uh, characterizing 2021. Now here's the, I like to show this, another thing I track here from uh, one of NOAA's uh, ocean temperature databases that goes way back. Um, this is, a, this is a, the Northern Bering Sea temperatures for the warm season, again, May through September, since 1900 for that area that's in the box there in the little insert. So this is basically uh, east of the date line and from the Pribilofs North. And so this is just the average temperature. As you can see on the far uh, right-hand side of the graphic, uh, the way I like to do these, uh, the 10 warmest years are in red, the 10 coolest years are in blue. And for the first time since 2013, we did not have a top 10 warmest. However, that's only because of the last uh, seven years. If this was 2012, we would be talking about, oh, what a warm summer this was in the Bering Sea. We would have very high uh, sea surface temperatures, but it isn't 2012, it's 2021. And, and uh, we actually have cooled down uh, from the last seven years, but that's cool only relative to this very recent past. 
And you can see the trend that gray, the uh, green line there is really quite, quite dramatic. We're talking a large area of water temperatures. Remember water being dense, temperature changes are slow. And so this is, we're talking about a lot of extra heat. Now that the average temperature May through September in the Northern Bering Sea is um, you know, up near 46 degrees instead of um, back uh, prior to World War II when it would have been below 42. That is a lot, a lot of extra heat. Now, um, I don't, uh, I'll, I'm gonna throw this out from, uh, from uh, NOAA Fisheries uh, State. You'll want to be here next uh, Thursday. Lyle Britt will be uh, telling us all about the NOAA surveys this summer, um, including uh, much more detailed information on ocean temperatures, but I do wanna put this out there uh, from fisheries kind enough to make this available to us. And this, so what we're looking at here is from the NOAA survey, the temperature at the very bottom of the Bering Sea in that, in that bottom layer, just a few feet above the bottom. And remember what we're looking for here uh, is that cold pool, that very cold, very salty water that historically was the demarcation between the Arctic-like marine environment to the north of that cold pool and a much more uh, North Pacific-like environment to the south. On this graphic, the, temp the waters that are uh, colder than 32 Fahrenheit uh, are, you can see, are confined. That's the deepest blue colors there. They're, that is confined basically to the area uh, west and southwest of St. Matthew Island as uh, Lyle will be showing next week. And as you may remember from the past, um, in years past, there would be that, that uh, colder than 32 degree water, very salty, sitting at the bottom of the Bering Sea would extend all the way down into the Western portion of Bristol Bay. Nothing like that this year. That's not a surprise given that the ice barely got past St. Matthew Island. No surprise to see that we don't have water anywhere near uh, that 32 degree mark uh, down there, um, kind of uh, east of the Pribilofs, uh, say north uh, northwest of Colt Bay there. But please tune in next week uh, for Lyle's presentation. I'm looking forward to that. But you can see here uh, a little bit of a spoiler, Cold Pool is way far north. All right, summer highlights. Yes, soggy. A soggy egg race on July 4th. Absolutely. Here's a, here's a little thing I made this up. Um, this is a new feature for this year. I kind of like the way this turned out. And some just some highlights here. Some of these things you may have forgotten about in, uh, in all the things that have happened since then. But started off um, after a war, some warm weather in May. Uh, for the first time ever, Nome had its first 70 degree temperature in late May, followed by accumulating snow. Uh, June 4 to 7, uh, pretty much everywhere, at least Gullivan westward, had some snow. Of course, early June snow is not unusual on St. Lawrence Island um, or through the Bering Strait. Doesn't happen every year, but it's not that unusual. And Nome, of course, is no stranger to June snow, but this was particularly long lasting and widespread. A um, little taste of summer we got in late, uh, late June there. We had the, a rash of thunderstorms and we did start some wildfires inland. They didn't wind up amounting to anything, but uh, we were watching those at the time. Of course, our very soggy 4th of July. Maybe, the, maybe the, the low light, if you will, of July was the very heavy rains um, in the last week of the month. Um, three days of rain. Um, uh, is in the top uh, five of uh, three-day rainfalls in Nome, uh, at least some minor flooding uh, on area rivers, and that really capped off um, uh, so the soggy July. Nome wound up uh, having the wettest July since uh, the 1920s, and this was the same month that Cotsview had their wettest month on record. Bethel also had their wettest July since the 1920s. Um, that was very quickly followed by our, this short, intense heat wave. Um, 
if you blinked, you might have missed it, but as we'll see, it was quite noticeable. Um, early frost uh, followed that. And then as we move this into September, um, I think more, more inland snow, at least in uh, September, than um, we've seen again in a few years. Nothing unusual historically, but um, in, our, in the short window is pretty, um, pretty impressive. So um, just a little bit more on, the, on the, the June snow here. A couple of nice pictures there uh, on the uh, left-hand side from the home office and uh, from IC view there uh, on the bottom right. Um, best estimate that we could come up with at Nome Airport, uh, 2.6 inches of snow total uh, over the four days. It was the first time that there's been a multi-day snow in Nome in June since um, 2008. And, um, and there was, accumul like I said, accumulations um, pretty much I, at least from Nome westward. Um, and can't remember if Gullivan had accumulation of that. It's certainly flurry. All of this was brought to us by this, vet, this uh, uh, turned out to be a, a uh, uh, what do we want to call it, a, um, a hint of uh, things to come. We had this very uh, stationary, low, cold, low pressure sat right over the Bering Strait. Um, these little knots of cold air are not unusual in the early summer, but this one was quite uh, different than they typically work out because usually these things move around and this was, uh, just took up residence over the Bering Strait and brought us um, this first multi-day snow in June since um, in, in what, uh, how many years is that? 13 years. All right, heavy rains for Nome. Uh, the, the three day total uh, over three inches, and that was good enough for uh, the second highest three day rainfall in 114 years here of record. Um, interestingly enough, um, the only uh, one that was higher was uh, way back in 2019. Uh, these ex excessive precipitation events, of course, have been in the news all around the globe during summer 2021. We, Alaska, we had our examples here. Of course, the, the uh, rains from uh, Tropical Storm Otis in uh, the New York City area, the tremendous rains in Germany and China. Um, this is exactly what we expect in a warming world. The atmosphere can hold more water when it's warmer. And when all the ingredients come together, you get these, ex these really excessive precipitation events. So, um, uh, not uh, in that sense, very much what we expect with, um, with a warming climate. All right, our heat wave here um, didn't last long, uh, two days in most places. Uh, what I, I really wanted to show this uh, in part because the temperatures um, at Wales and at Tin City there, um, as near as I can tell, we don't have solid climate records, but there does not appear to be anything in what data that we have that are anywhere near uh, this warm. Um, so really quite spectacularly warm in this heat wave, temperatures pushing 90 degrees inland Seward Peninsula, and um, even on St. Lawrence Island, Savunka, 70 degrees. Didn't stay 70 very long, but it what did reach 70 at the airport at Savunga, first 70 degree temp there since 2017. So uh, a short lived but very impressive uh, heat wave in an otherwise uh, dreary summer. All right, that's where we've been. Now we get to the uh, winter outlook portion of the program. So here's what we've got going on, our tools for our, for our climate outlook. Okay, as we've seen, Sea surface temperatures, Chukchi and Northern Bering Sea are near to below normal. By themselves, that's not, that's not, you know, okay, near to below, that doesn't sound too bad, but again, very different than most of the last few years. Sea ice, especially in the Chukchi Sea, we've got much more of it for, for at this point in the season than we've had the last several years. And as you probably heard in the news, uh, for the second consecutive year, we have a La Nina going on in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. How can small differences in temperatures and winds in the uh, Pacific Ocean, a thousand miles south of Hawaii, affect Western Alaska weather? Well, it does that by modulating where those giant tropical thunderstorms form. During La Nina, they tend to be favored in the far Western 
Pacific, so kind of like north of Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands there. And that in turn keeps the jet stream back across Asia and favors uh, downstream. So towards Alaska, that favors a storm track that in general stays south of the Northern Bering Sea region. And uh, so as a result, there is a, uh, in some years a better chance for prolonged periods of cold weather. Now, having said that, one of the hallmarks for La Nina in Western Alaska is that when the conditions tend to be highly variable. So you can have several weeks of unusually cold weather, several weeks of unusually stormy, mild weather. Does this sound like any winter that you've lived through recently? Maybe 2020, 21? Yes, it probably does. All right, here's where the sea surface temperatures are uh, for the first 24 days of October. As I said, generally near to below normal, uh, but mostly not dramatically so um, in either direction. Um, it's really, um, the Gulf of Alaska is what really stands out here for, uh, for below normal temperatures. That's a reflection of the um, last year's and this ongoing La Nina conditions, as well as up um, kind of northwest of Utkiavik there where it is significantly cooler than the long-term normals. But in the Bering Sea, except for the Gulf of uh, Anadir, not too far below normal, but not the heat of the last few winters, or the last few falls, I should say. Sea ice, so this is the sea ice as of Tuesday, or October 26th for the last three years. 2019 is on the left, last year is in the middle, and uh, this year, Tuesday's analysis, all these from the National Weather Service uh, sea ice program on the right. And so just eyeballing it, you can see way, way more ice in the central and northern Chukchi Sea. And notice uh, that even now, now, this year, so on the, the rightmost graphic here, we have ice creeping down the uh, north uh, shore of Chukotka. We didn't have, we actually, you have to go back to about 2004. 14, I think, uh, before we had that ice in place there at this point in the season. So we got way more ice. Water temperatures are not um, on, not hot. So we don't have our the thumbs on the scale for late freeze up the way we had the last few falls. Now, I showed this graphic last year at this time from Straight Science. So I thought I'd update it here. La Nina and Nome. So we're looking at midwinter temperatures here, December, uh, January, February. And so this is all of the moderate and strong uh, La Nina events um, and the departures uh, from the 50 year average. What you can see here is that on the, on the far right hand side of the graphic, um, last year, De December, January, February, the average temperature was actually above that 50 year normal. Most, but by no means all, we now have three of La Nina's are, are cooler than that 50 year average. As I have annotated there, we often get very large variability during these winters. So those of you that remember 1989, remember the 54 below all time record low in Nome, super cold January, um, Fewer people remembered that that was followed by a super warm February, uh, really a, just an incredible swing. And we've had these swings uh, multiple times during these, uh, the, these La Nina winter. Of course, that happens in other times, but it, for instance, it's less common to have these kind of swings during El Ninos. How about snowfall? Well, if you want snow, um, this is, this is uh, the, uh, the thing for you. So now we're not looking at midwinter. Now we're looking at the whole season. So November through April. And this is just the total snowfall in Nome over the whole season during, our, during the moderate and strong La Nina winters. The blue bars were above normal, the, uh, the orange bars below normal. So. Uh, except for the three La Ninas in the 1970s, they're all above normal. Of course, I had to estimate um, last winter since um, we're not getting, uh, don't have good estimates for snowfall last year, but 
certainly with the March and April snows last year, I think that pushed us above normal and our computer analysis model suggests that as well. So if you wanna put some money down on this winter, put it, put it into your snowplow because odds are you'll get to use it. Oops, wrong direction. All right, uh, one of the things um, I always show here well, sea ice is not something that is uh, forecast as part of the uh, official package by NOAA. They are running an experimental seasonal sea ice outlook, uh, runs out nine months. And one of the products that comes out of this uh, model system, it's actually uh, an ensemble system, 20 different uh, runs of this model is when the first ice is. So when, when the ice concentration uh, first reaches 15% or more. So, um, so not open water. And this was, this is run once a month. This is the outlook that was run in late September. Um, so it's getting kind of old here, uh, either end of next week or the following week, the new, new outlook will be released. But I've, uh, I've been this by half month intervals and then labeled it uh, for your Keys of interpretation uh, color bar there is on the bottom. So there's several things that you're going to notice here. Is that for one, especially in the north, it looks like this model is too quick with ice. For instance, it has Kotzebue Sound icing up uh, all of Kotzebue Sound east, east of Cape Espenberg um, in, in the first half of October. That has not happened. Um, that's not unexpected. This model is not really designed to work in small confined areas, um, uh, you know, land enclosed areas like Kotzebue Sound, um, even like Norton Sound. So it's, I don't think it's a problem that the model's not right there. Maybe it's a little bit more of a problem. You'll notice there kind of west of the North Slope Coast, kind of west of Wainwright, west of Point Lay, it's got late October for first ice. Um, that is not going to work out. There is ice near shore there right now, uh, but um, we're not going to get ice in the open water. Similarly, there's still, there's still some a small band of open water um, beyond the shore ice uh, east of uh, Point Barrow in the Beaufort Sea. So it's probably a little aggressive uh, in this forecast, but nonetheless, Notice this model does have um, first ice to diamede the second half of November and then moving south to St. Lawrence Island during the first half of December. That, that is probably, based on what we're seeing, this is probably not bad. Maybe it's a little week too quick. Um, maybe it's the first days of, no, of December that ice gets to diamede. Maybe it's, you know, not maybe it's closer to mid-December till ice gets to St. Lawrence Island, but I don't think this is wildly bad given we've already got ice working down the, the north shore of Chukotka, given that the water temperatures here are not very far above freezing in the Chukchi Sea, this is probably a pretty, um, pretty reasonable forecast. Now, whether the ice will really get to St. Paul uh, and St. George this fall, probably, you know, this is this is uh, much more um, speculative. But for the Northern Bering Sea region, I think in the open water areas here, this is okay. I still think that this is, a, again, a, an aggressive forecast for Norton Sound. I would be mildly surprised if we had uh, this much ice, say, from Nome to, um, to Stebbins and St. Michael and everywhere east was iced up by, um, or not open water by uh, the middle of, of November. That may be a little bit quick, but might not be off by very much. Certainly all the signs are pointing to earlier ice in the Northern Bering Sea than we've had most of the last several years. All right, sea surface temperatures. Here I'm gonna rely on uh, this product again, produced by our colleagues uh, at the World Climate Service. And so this is just the chances for um, above, below, or near normal sea surface temperatures based on the, um, the, the seasonal computer uh, forecasts here. And the interesting thing here is really that you'll notice that over the Southwest Bering Sea, 
extending to about the Pribilofs, chances favor that continued above normal sea surface temperatures that we saw in the, in the warm season average and that have been there for most of 2021. But that does not extend uh, really south to the north, uh, up towards St. Matt, where the, that white color indicates um, equal chances for near, above, and below normal temperatures. So again, some hope from the computer models here that in the central Bering Sea, not as warm as last winter. Now, the white space does not mean near normal, means above or below are equally likely. A computer model uh, temperature and precipitation forecasts, again, from the World Climate Service. So this uses two different um, computer models. And I, I like to show this because not only uh, do, uh, in this product, or is this just the average of two different models, but the colors that you get here, which are the chances of above, below, and near normal, they're, the models are weighted by how good they actually are. What a novel idea, right? Um, and so that uh, the, the models at each, at each point, the one that does better gets more weight. That's all well and good. You'll notice the, uh, the yellow dot there over gnome, we have exactly no color over us. So we're not favoring above or below normal temperatures or precipitation across Western Alaska in this particular uh, computer model setup. Finish up here with the official NOAA forecast, came out last week. So starting with November through uh, January, three month season, no tilt in the temperature chances. Equal chances again does not mean near normal, it means above normal, below normal, near normal, all equally likely. But, but precipitation on the right hand side, you'll notice Western Alaska is in that second shade of green. That means according to the experts at the Climate Prediction Center, they're going for a twice as likely to be significantly more precipitation than normal as there is for significantly less. So that's a strong tilt towards that above normal precipitation. Shouldn't be a surprise given that graphic that we saw of known seasonal snowfall. December through February, the midwinter season really very similar. For Western Alaska, no tilt in the temperature odds, again, continuing to fav favor wetter than normal. So for midwinter, more snow than normal for all of the region. And finally, the second uh, half of the winter, January through March, getting into early spring. And this is when La Nina often rears its head most prominently across mainland Alaska is uh, late winter season. Um, CPC, though, did not decide to tilt the odds towards cool across western Alaska. They did expand the area um, into the uh, northern interior there, but did not push it much west. So equal chances for temperatures, but continue that wet tilt on precipitation across the region. So um, really, uh, to sum things up, cool, wet summer regionally, uh, in some places, uh, the wettest everywhere. Um, amongst the cloudiest if you're under the age of uh, social security. Um, uh, Southern Chukchi, Northern Bering Sea uh, freeze up. We have a better chance for earlier than recent years. Not probably, well, it's not like the old days, but very good chance based on our current conditions that it's gonna be earlier than it's been. With La Nina, look for big temperature swings. You know, really cold one month, really warm the next month would not at all be surprising. And La Nina favoring above normal snowfall across the region. So that's what I have for you, to, to, for you tonight. Uh, and uh, thanks to, um, to Gay and Northwest Campus, um, ACAP of course for supporting me, World Climate Service for uh, the graphics. And most of all, um, thanks to you for taking time out of your evening to join us. Um, and uh, shameless plug, if you're interested in Western Alaska weather, um, check out our uh, Facebook uh, group, uh, Seward Peninsula Bering Strait Weather and Climate Info. Um, uh, often get some nice photos and I post um, regionally interesting climate stuff, or it's at least it's interesting to me. 
And um, we'd welcome to have you if you care about that kind of stuff. So thanks a lot. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rick. And I'll, I'll double that plug for the Facebook group. Um, if you are a member of that, know that I know that Rick really enjoys if you put in pictures of, of what's going on in your area. So don't be shy on that. And we, we like that, Rick. So thank you. Thank you so much. So first off, audience, I'm sure there's some questions. I know I've, I've got a couple, but um, let's give our speaker uh, some love in the chat box. So if you are not a caller, but you're on the computer, feel free to um, use the chat feature at the bottom where it looks like a little cartoon bubble and uh, show some love for Rick. We really, really appreciate what you do, Rick, for the region and taking the time to give us such a, a good and right on the money um, presentation about what we went through here and what, what's ahead. We're just really grateful for that. Um, yeah. While people are doing that, we do have a caller and I just wanted to give a shout out because again, it's hard to be a caller on a Zoom call. For our caller, do you have any questions or comments for Rick? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't have any questions yet. All right, I, I had a question actually for, for um, Native Village of Diomede. When I saw that big, I don't know if you could follow along, but there was a big green spot when he was talking about total rainfall. And I think it was something, I, I don't know, Rick, if that was right, but where Diomede was, it was like 250% of yep. above their normal rainfall. And um, I know that I had heard about some slides um, with the, the side of the hill. Were those in, do you remember those? I, and if the, oh, go ahead. No, you, you, you didn't finish. Do I remember? Do, were you on slides? the island for nope. those? If they were in July and as a kind of a result, I was thinking, wow, I never had seen, heard of so many slides. And then I saw Rick's graphic with the rainfall and just wondered if that was about the same time as those slides where the rocks were coming down. Yep, that that probably that probably was it cuz okay. we we got a lot of snow last year and then um it was a really rainy summer for Dimey. Yep. Yep. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. So if you have any other questions just speak up cuz I know it's you're the only caller and it's hard to be seen. You can't raise your hand. So Yeah. Um so I was I was thinking I I don't have your slides yet, but um, it would be nice. I can't wait to see the sea ice maps for. I, I believe he said it's going to be for November. Fingers crossed, OPEC for the end of November. Okay, end of November, and then the ice. You you're talking about the ice. <clears throat> the uh, sea ice that's above us. In 2021, is the sea ice is closer to the strait than it was in 2020? Oh yeah, yeah. There's much more ice in the in the Chukchi Sea um, than the last several years, both in the north, so kind of um, north and west of Utqiagvik, but also we have ice forming now already along the north um, coast of Chukotka, north of the strait, northwest of the strait. Um, which we haven't had at this point in the season um, in some years, I think since 2014 or so. Oh, yeah. I would love to see maps from, you know, beyond, from earlier times, maybe the they're early on the, 2000s. They're, they're on the way. You were emailed, so it must okay. be stuck somewhere, but it's, it's coming. And um, we can talk more to this week, tomorrow. If you need, if you're not getting those, I can print them out and put them on no, the chopper. I'll, yeah, I'll get them eventually. But yeah, I can, I can. That's cool. I, I like that there's ice, um, you know, on above us, above us, and then on the Chukchi side. So yeah, we're seeing, we're having more northwest winds this week, last week, too. So we're cooling down. Yep. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rick. You bet. All right, in the chat box, there's a question from, uh, I can't, it's hard for me to read the whole name here. Betsy Turner Bogren, Arcus. Um, is that all new, new ice, no multi-year ice, question mark? And any idea about sea ice thickness? Um, yes, a good question, uh, Betsy. Um, let's see, um, were you specifically referring to the current ice conditions? Oops, sorry, hit the wrong button. No, it's good. I think I was, I was referring to the, uh, the map that you had of um, current ice. Yes, that's the one I was looking at. And I, it's, it's, I'm pretty sure that my understanding is that all three years the it's there isn't multi-year ice in that is that correct so in the north here um you know probably north of 74 north there was some multi-year ice uh principally second and third year ice that did survive um and and that probably helped maintain um the ice in that part of the chuck chi uh through the summer but i think that's the secondary to the persistently cloudy cold weather. Um, if, if it would have been a more normal weather, um, most of that multi-year ice would have melted away. All, all the ice south of Wrangell Island here, this is all new ice. Right. Um, so at this point that would all be, of course, quite thin and, uh, yet. Um, and, and most of the Chuck GC ice will be thin as well, except where that multi-year ice um, survived. But that's that's mostly pretty far north yet. And I guess related, if I could follow up the um, the sea ice outlook graph that you had for uh, probability of dates of sea ice extent at fifteen percent, that would all that's 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 all also going to be very low on multi-year ice. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. So this is all. This is is the first date when the ice concentration gets to fifteen percent or above. Um, okay. does, you know, it can in the model, you can get to that threshold and then it could retreat. You get the first date that it happens. Um, but this would this would be, I mean, the model can move ice around, but for our area, um, this is going to be basically when the ice either gets blown in by the wind or forms in place. Thank you. All right, thanks, Betsy. And you also have a question from Bill. Does the lack of cold bottom water have significant wider implications to Northern Pacific circulation? That is a very interesting question. And um, I, I am gonna plead um, ignorance to that. I don't know. I, my gut is that it, it um, Probably doesn't because this is very cold, stable water at the bottom of the bearing. But I, I would definitely defer to um, the physical oceanographers on its ramifications for the larger Pacific. Certainly for and the bearing, there's a big ecological impact, of course. And I hope that answers your question, Bill. Um, Deanna Hacker has a question. Can you make any predictions if it will be windier as well as colder and wetter? Uh, Deanna, you know what? I looked at that. Um, our, our colleagues at the World Climate Service actually do produce from the climate models, they do produce a, a graphic um, showing tilts and wind speed. And um, I didn't put it in the slide deck because it has it doesn't tilt the odds at all. Um, there's, and there's, there's basically, there's no skill in the climate models for windiness. Um, but it is something I'm well aware that people, it's a, you know, it's a major concern for Western Alaska and I'm always looking for tools to get at that. Um, but at this point, um, there's really no skill in the model forecast for that. All right. Anybody have any um, questions they want to voice in person? Now is your chance. We've gone through the chat.
All right. I, my question is, oh, go ahead, Lyle. Got his hand up. You're so you're so nice, and um, you know how to run those icons. Thanks, Lyle. Go ahead. Well, uh, you, you say I know how to run the icons, but I was a little late trying to find the button to raise my hand. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> uh, thanks again, Rick, for a really good talk. Uh, I find this really informative. Um, I had a question for you. You know, you showed our uh, near real time uh, sea surface or uh, uh, near the uh, seafloor bottom temperatures. And the area, um, you know, Norton Sound and along the Alaska coast was incredibly warm again this year. And I was kind of expecting you to maybe be able to give me a, with some of your data a, some explanation for this. I was expecting to see that, you know, like the inland areas were kind of warm. And maybe this was a runoff kind of effect that we're seeing in Norton Sound and kind of north of Nunavak. Of course, some of this is just because it's really shallow and you're getting a lot of solar effect, but it's still incredibly warm and more so than what we thought with our slightly cooler temperatures this year. And I'm just wondering if you have any ideas. Yeah, that I have given that some thought, um, Lyle. Um, you know, because when this was coming in, you know, Gay was Gay and I were chatting about really warm temperatures in Norton Sound and near the coast. And given as cloudy as it was, I mean, there wasn't that much sun to, to suck up the, for the water to suck up the heat from, and the air temperatures were, were not real warm. The, so I have to think that this is, um, uh, in, at least to some extent, being driven by freshwater runoff um, from the Yukon and the, the Seward Peninsula rivers. Um, because I don't think the, the meteorology itself is accounting for the, the very warm near shore temperatures that we're seeing. Now, to what extent also the Alaska current is involved here, um, you know, that could be a factor too. But again, farther south, Bristol Bay region, Alaska Peninsula, it was a much warmer winter than in the northern Bering Sea relative to normal. But um, would that account for the very warm nearshore temperatures that, um, that uh, we're seeing at the bottom? That I don't know. All right, thanks. I was hoping you'd give me kind of the, uh, uh, the silver bullet to understanding this. The, the, one, uh, one, other, one other thought. So by the, time, by the time you got north of Nunavak here, the survey dates here are mostly in August, right? Yes, I mean, certainly that strong demarcation that you see um, just north of Nunavak, that's, that's an artifact of the timing of the survey, so that it's not that strong of a delineation in temperature rate there. Um, however, one thing that is not plotted here, I'll tell you, is that we had to do some resampling for another part of our research, which meant that we went back in August into uh, Bristol Bay for some sampling. And so we've been able to compare those temperatures. And while they were slightly warmer um, by about a half a degree, by the time we went back, they were certainly not on the level of what we're seeing north of Nunavak. The, the other thought I had with these warm temperatures, so, they, so this is pretty late in the summer, um, July being as stormy as it was, and this water as shallow as it is, was, was there more mixing of, this, of the water column this summer because of all the, the, and the repeated storminess in, in this region during uh, July in particular. Did that help mix down uh, or mix up the water column? And so get that, get that warm water uh, down to the bottom. That, that might be something to look at as well. Oh, sorry, Dave, I'm taking up everybody's time, but. Uh, just to follow up on that, there was it's a good, Lyle. Keep, it's that okay, area. Lyle. Don't don't worry about time. Uh, but so that yes, that it, actually those temperatures are not only warm, but they were homogenous pretty much from the surface all the way to the bottom, which also makes this even more um, interesting because typically when we get that level of mixing, while you do raise temperatures, you're also kind of uh, tempering what those values would be instead of them being all at a high level. So uh, I. Yeah, I, I'm still concerned about this and trying to figure this one out. Okay, thanks a lot. And looking forward to your presentation next week.
So yeah, I'll give a shout out to um, for the next two Thursdays, save the date because Lyle Britt is going to give us straight science next week and he's gonna give the results of the Northern Bering Sea Fish Survey, the bottom trawl survey. And then the next week will be Jim Murphy of NOAA Fisheries who's gonna talk about the surface trawl survey results for the Northern Bering Sea. So. Um, with Rick leading the way with the weather, we're getting a one, two, three punch on what happened to our ecosystem. Um, and that's, that's we're A, very appreciative and B, very interested in finding out how we're doing. And it helps explain some of what we're seeing with the animals and uh, other things. Um, and I wanted to say for me, you know, I, I had an ability to ask my questions a little earlier, but I really want to say thank you for adding that northern sea route ice open water uh, metric, that graph, because what is noticeable to me, and I'm always kind of nosing around about these new this new development of these 970, 80 foot LNG Russian ARC-7 ice capable tankers that are coming out of the Yamal Peninsula and running down. And so I think it was your slide before this one that really caught my eye where it was so open water, cold for us, ice around the Beaufort, yep, and we're kind of looking normal, but so open on that ship channel. And I just wonder, will they, do you think there'll be any multi-year ice or all that will fill in with just first year ice, you think? Oh, I did on the on the Russian coast here. Correct. Oh, this is yeah. going to all be first year ice. Um, this so day, no this the multi year ice in the Beaufort Gyre is gonna is gonna wind up. Oops, gonna wind up uh, going north and get sucked into the the transpolar drift. Um, all of this stuff um, it, along the Russian coast is going to be first year ice. Except except maybe there was a little bit of ice there in that patch there. Um, New Siberian on. Islands. Um, yep. You know, the, some of that did survive the melt season. And so that, but that will be the only multi-year ice. Yeah, we see where those ships get hung up in that, those New Siberian Islands where that archipelago kind of holds, holds the ice in. So um, for people from the Bering Strait region know that it looks like, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of people with NSCDC and myself and, and certainly others in the Bering Strait region that will be watching uh, for these tankers. It looks like the Russians may want to try to send these right through the winter. They had some success last year as we saw them go January, February, and um, stay tuned on that. It looks like they may go for it and the, and run it, try for it um, this winter as well. So we'll stay abreast of that as best we can. So thank you so much for putting those in. Um, and thank you for the radiation, solar radiation, because fireweed and several other plants in one's yard and, and the road and the tundra, we're having a heck of a time. And it helps explain why fireweed was just comprehensively, people were writing in all kinds of crazy stuff. Our fireweed grew like a weed and then fell over without much in the way of flowers. And so it, it really, thank you for, the, for presenting sort of that solar look as well for it, that this summer affected the plants as well. Um. Charlie had a remark about the Mackenzie uh, River Delta being warm. Yeah. And um, I, so I've moved it back to this slide here. And this was really interesting. Um, that we saw a big response here. Um, Mackenzie River, of course, comes up through here. And here's the Delta. And during that late June North American heat dome, when Seattle got to 108 and Whiten, BC got to whatever, they got to 121 or something. We saw the reflection in the Mackenzie water uh, river temperatures as they came out here into the delta here. And to be honest with you, Charlie, I was expecting that this was going to really accelerate sea ice melt in the eastern Beaufort here. And it did a little bit, but it was never able to spread um, to spread westward uh, the way I expected it to. to because often we see this Mackenzie water work to the east of Kaktovik, and that just didn't happen, at least as far as the temperatures go. So that was really interesting to watch. So thanks for pointing that out. And interestingly, that's not occurring in eastern Norton Sound. 
No, no, where we, where we didn't have that, we didn't have the, you know, even, while the temperatures were, were not as cool in the interior as they were through Western Alaska, that was by no means unusually warm uh, at all. I was just thinking of the bottom waters, but thank you. Thank you very much. And Bill Witt, I don't know if I pronounced that right, added and thunderstorms in the Mackenzie River Delta area. Oh uh -huh. yeah, so yeah, we had lots of um, lots of interesting thunder, not necessarily a lot, but we did have some episodes in unusual places. In addition to those late June thunderstorms over the Seward Peninsula that started those, those short-lived fires, um, there was another day in July uh, when we had thunderstorms run up through Eastern Norton Sound. Um, as I recall, um, folks, um, Eastern Norton Sound community, several hours of lightning. And then the next day, they, that weather system was up on the North Slope and produced, um, again, a multi-hour thunderstorm and lightning um, at Atkasuk. So um, wow. uh, was it wasn't overall a very active uh, thunderstorm season, but we did have thunder noticeable thunder in places that don't get thunder all that often. All right. My dog is having bad dreams. If you can hear him, he's groaning in the background. Don't <laughs> disregard. Um, well, thank you all. If there's no other questions, nothing from the caller, no other questions, no other chats, I would say you brought it home, Rick. Thank you so much. And I will, um, you got lots of nice comments in the, in the chat section. So um, we are very appreciative in the Bering Strait region for all you do and your expertise with our geography and the way things work out here. And um, we are just really appreciative. You bet. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks everyone for joining and um, have a good evening, good weekend. See you next week.